thank you for the introduction, and I'm honored to be here, especially since it's uh, particle physics, physics, and cosmology, and I'm an atomic physicist by training, so I'm really glad that perhaps atomic physicists can make a contribution in other field. So this is about atom interferometry constraints on a model of dark energy, which we found to be ruled out by our data. I want to talk about this experiment in particular, but I also want to give you an introduction on the broader subject, subject of using precision measurements to learn fundamental facts about the world. We know this has an extremely long tradition. For example, people like Angström and Rydberg measured hydrogen spectral lines very accurately. And a Swiss high school teacher named Balmer collected all that data and tabulated it. And so when Heisenberg and Schrodinger found the first two versions of quantum mechanics, they could see immediately that their new crazy quantum mechanics reproduced those measured spectral lines to very high accuracy. And so no matter how crazy their new physics might have seemed to their colleagues, they had solid experimental evidence that they were onto something. This is just one example from the older history of physics, how precision measurements can help discovering fundamental facts about nature. So there'll be an introduction where I'll introduce the problem of dark matter and dark energy. Then there'll be a section on technology and then about the fine structure constant and about this particular kind of dark energy dubbed a chameleon. The reason I'm talking about the fine structure constant also is that a precision measurement of the fine structure constant might just be the same as the precision measurement of the hydrogen spectral lines. It's basically measuring a number but also measuring a number to such high precision that there might be a new discovery in there. And then there'll be an outlook. I, by the way, apologize for the hum. Um, I used to be a, did a lot of electronics as a hobby before I entered university, bought, built some audio amplifiers, and they all sounded like this. This is why I started doing physics. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dark and uh, uh, the introduction. Um, the standard model of particle physics, successful as it, will, as it is, it has never made a prediction that was found to be ruled out by experiment. It is nevertheless known to be incomplete. And by that, I don't mean an academic problem, such as the incompatibility of general relativity and quantum mechanics. You might have heard about that. That is a very fundamental and very tough problem, but it could also be said to be very academic because there's no single experiment that requires the unification of the two in order to be explained. I'm talking about a very observed fact, and some of these facts are plotted here. If you look at one star that's orbiting around a galaxy, you would expect that the further away from the core of the galaxy it is, the slower it moves. Because due to the larger distance, there's less gravitational force to keep the galaxy from spinning apart. So you would expect the speed as a function of distance to go down, like shown in the red line here. But the observation is that the speed is roughly constant. That could mean that the laws of gravity need to be modified. There was such an attempt called modified Newtonian dynamics. Or it could mean that there must be extra mass that we can't see. And right now, most astronomers agree that there must be extra mass, and they have solid evidence for it. One piece of evidence is shown here. If I have a distant object, and I'm observing it on Earth, and there's something heavy in between, such as a galaxy. Then the light will curve around that heavy object due to the gravitational pull on the light. So I would see the, seen from the Earth, I would see that object in two directions. That's called gravitational lensing, and the result is depicted here. From the amount of gravitational lensing, we can reconstruct where 
the extra mass is and how much there is. And the result is in this overlay plot where the purple is the observed matter of a particular object. I don't know the name. It's been done with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And the blue is the reconstructed mass distribution from gravitational lensing. And you see, A, there is more mass than is visible, and B, it's at a different location. And we have no idea what this extra mass could be. It's usually assumed to be a new particle. We know that none of the known particles serves as an explanation, in part because it has to be in a certain mass range, in part because there's no known mechanism which could produce so much visible matter, and so on. So all we know about all this excess mass is what it is not. We know it's not a neutrino, and so on, but we don't know what it is. It gets better or worse, depending on um, your point of view. A couple of, probably 20 or 30 years ago, one of my UC Berkeley colleagues, Richard Muller, and his student at the time, Saul Paul Mutter, started to think, well, the universe started by a Big Bang, and therefore it expands. And because there's gravity, this expansion obviously has to slow down. The big question is, does it slow down enough to eventually reverse, or will it keep expanding forever? And they thought there must be a way to measure this. So if stuff moves away from the Earth, it will be gravitational redshifted. We can measure that redshift and therefore know how fast it moves. If we, in addition, know how far the object is away, then we can make a plot that tells us the speed relative to distance. And that should be a signature for the speed of cosmic expansion as a function of time. The distance axis is a time axis because, um, because the light from far away has been traveling for a long time. right? And they found a way to actually measure the distance because they realized that all supernovae, star explosions, have very accurately the same brightness. And so if I see a supernova, it will be less bright if it's further away, and that provides my standard candle to measure the distance. And the result is shown here. And um, to their great surprise, they tried to measure the slowing down of the expansion, and they found the opposite. It actually speeds up. Okay? This data has been confirmed by a second team at, um, on the East Coast. And meanwhile, by other data, here's cosmic microwave background data from the Planck satellite. And you can also look for oscillations that are called baryon acoustic oscillations. And the result is summarized in this plot, where this axis is the dark energy density. And this is the normal matter density. Normal matter, by the way, this includes normal matter, us, and dark matter. And the cosmic concordance is that all these three methods of measuring agree that this point is compatible with all data. And it points to a universe that consists to 70% of dark energy and about 30% of rest. This is plotted here. And of these, well, actually 25%, four percentage points is normal matter. That's us. In that sense, 96% of the universe are some unknown form of mass energy. Now the big question is, what could it be? So this is, again, the um, picture I've already shown. So it might be a new particle. I'm going to focus on dark matter for a while and come back to dark energy at the end. It's been observed solely through the gravitational interaction with normal matter. We don't know what its mass is. We don't know whether it has any interactions in addition to gravity. It could, it could not. And the big question is, how can we find out? And the simple answer might be, we have to detect it in any non-gravitational way. Then we would know what the mass is, that it has non-gravitational interactions, and so on. 
But these effects, if they exist at all, must be very weak. Otherwise, we would have seen them already. And therefore, we need to find very sensitive experiments. One problem is, so ideally, you want to build a super detector that somehow looks for any kind of unknown stuff. And when you find, when your detector finds the unknown stuff, you go to Stockholm, right? And the problem is there is no such universal super detector. So what we have to do is make an educated guess what the new particle could be like, and then look for this kind of thing. And if we are very lucky, we have been looking in the right corner, and if we are not lucky, we have to try again. The axis here is an enormous mass scale. Dark matter particles might have any mass less than about 10 to 24 grams. That's actually something like the mass of a planet. We know that dark matter cannot be a particle heavier than that, or we would have seen it by, its, by the action of its gravity on other objects. We also know that it cannot weigh less than about 10 to minus 55 gram. <laughs> because if it was that light, so we're talking here about something like 10 or 20 orders of magnitude lighter than an electron, right? So this is very, very light. If it was that light, then it would not clump to form galaxies. It would just spread out into the entire universe and thereby become a candidate for dark energy. Dark energy, we know, is spread uniformly in the universe, not concentrated in galaxies, right? The neutrino, nobody knows. We have upper limits, um, which are on the order of one electron volt, maybe a little bit better. Uh, that, so it would be somewhere here. So neutrinos are definitely viable from the mass point of view, but for some other reasons that you have to ask my particle colleagues about, they are not considered dark matter candidates, at least not directly. People talk about other types of neutrinos. They dub them sterile neutrinos. That could be a candidate, but the plain neutrino that we all know is not for some reason. That it, no, the mass would be right in the right range. But this range is fast, so that doesn't mean much. <laughs> um, what was so? If you read an article about dark matter five or 10 years ago, then this region, the purple region here, is probably what they were talking about. Um, this has historical reasons. For theorists, it is easier to invent heavy particles without running into contradictions with other assumptions. And so most people speculated that dark matter must be a relatively heavy particle called a weakly interacting massive particle, short WIMP. And so giant detectors have been built, let's say a tank of liquid xenon, and you wait for the WIMP particle to go through and then give off Cherenkov light that you would detect, or similar ways, right? And there has been no uncontested evidence for WIMPs so far. People are still building better detectors, so maybe one day they will be. I want to talk about this region, the ultralight density, uh, the ultralight mass range, mostly because this is where atomic physicists, physics experiments can contribute and because it hasn't been researched much yet. What has been researched is this one. And super heavy, like dark matter particles the size of the moon or something like that, that would be a question for the astronomy colleagues. right? So we'll be looking into this region. And it's mostly been unresearched so far. Hello? Uh, no? Why are we doing this? Well, science has sometimes been compared to somebody who's looking for the key at night. And it's easier to look for the key under the street light. But that doesn't mean the key is there. It just <laughs> means that it's futile to look anywhere else. If you're lucky, the street light is in the right place. But if you're not lucky, then you won't find the key. 
if that analogy holds true, if science is indeed like looking for the key at night, then developing a new kind of measurement is like turning on a new light. That's we want, what we want to do. So we're looking at the ultralight region, right? There are lots of theory candidates. They go by the names of axions or axion-like particles, familions, relaxions, hidden photons, dark photons, and so on. From my experimental perspective, I don't need to know much about these. All I need to know is one important property. They will have a very large number density. Think about a gamma ray or an X-ray, which you detect. It will cause a click in a Geiger counter, right? But they are photons. So heavy photons look like particles. They cause clicks. But very light photons would be radio waves. And you usually would not try to detect them by counting photons. You would detect them by using an antenna and an amplifier. They would look like an electromagnetic wave. And that's the key here. Being extremely light, these dark matter candidates would look like a classical potential, an unknown potential that hasn't been discovered yet. And so you need to look for their collective effect. You can't detect a single air molecule with a windmill, but when the wind blows, the windmill can detect that. And that's the same spirit here. We'll have lots of these particles because each one is so light. So we can look for the collective effect. Here's one example by the so-called Advanced Cold Molecule EDM Collaboration, for short ACME. They look for a permanent electric dipole moment of an electron. In other words, they look for an electron which has most of its charge on one side and not so much on the other side. That's impossible if the electron is a point particle, as we think. Um, so any discovery of such an EDM would be considered physics beyond the standard model, except there's a tiny prediction for such an EDM in the standard model. But there are much larger predictions in theories of supersymmetry. So here are several flavors of supersymmetry, which make predictions for EDMs in a certain range. And the interesting fact is, at the current level, of experimental accuracy, already some of these model, models are starting to become ruled out. And the experimental precision might advance more and more, eventually ruling out one supersymmetric model after the other, or find a signature for them. That could be true. That could be true. Yeah, um, you're right on. Obviously, no theorist would write a model that sits here, right? And the good thing is that this news is now communicated between physics subfields. For decades, there was virtually no communication between atomic physics and high energy physics, or not too much. The atomic physicists have always claimed that we can make a contribution, but they didn't believe us. But they're starting to believe it. I hope. So this isn't my work, but it's an example for how you can make statements about particle physics by <coughs> measuring tiny quantities. If the dark matter is an axion, then here's a generic way of detecting it. The axion would try to turn the spin of particles. You know that an electron is a little magnet. It has its magnetic dipole moment point a certain way. And the axion would try to turn that. That way, it would be aligning the elementary magnets that are the electrons in some sample. They would generate a magnetic field, which I can measure with a sensitive um, magnetic field detector. And that would rule out this axion model. There's a collaboration funded in fact, by the Simons Foundation and the Heising Simons Foundation that attempts to do just that. It's called the Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment. It's a collaboration between colleagues at Stanford, Berkeley, and Mainz. And they are setting up and hoping to get a 
sensitivity much beyond what can be done right now. So that's not an experiment I'm doing. It's just a, another experiment in that flavor, looking for dark matter in atomic physics experiments. All right. You can then also look for other types of effects. Not all candidates of dark matter will try to generate magnetic fields. And they are harder to detect. Magnetic fields we have tremendously good sensors for. But some will not couple to the spin, but just to the motion of particles. Then I would need to look for, take an atom and see if it starts to move in some way. And the atomic physics method to do that is an atom interferometer. And that's what I want to talk about. So why am I relatively confident that this is the right way to go? Atomic physics is one of the few fields of human endeavor which can claim to have a sort of Morse law, where you have a factor of two improvement of some benchmark figure every roughly two years. For example, this is the precision of atomic clocks from 1950 to now. We started at 10 to the minus 10, a precision of timekeeping of 10 digits, and went all the way to a precision of timekeeping that's close to 18 digits in the past 60 years. This is a Morse law. Not many fields in physics have such a Morse law. So if there's any effect that the new particle has on normal matter, I'm relatively confident that one day we will be able to see it if it exists. Maybe not now, maybe not in 10 years, but with this exponential progress, there will be a time when it's possible. One of the reasons for the fast progress is that atomic physics, you don't think of an atomic physics experiment of the scale of the LHC, where thousands of people are involved, and where it takes 30 committee meetings to make a small decision. But you think about maybe a PI and two or three grad students per experiment where you can make decisions over a cup of coffee. And that's one of the reasons for this rapid progress. Yes, uh, what is Moore's law? Oh, Moore's law is the observation in the semiconductor industry that the number of transistors in a chip doubles roughly every two years. I'm sorry, I should have told you. I'm sorry. OK. OK, so what's an atom interferometer? It's a sensor for tiny forces. The force of gravity on a single atom is very feeble. An atom interferometer can measure it to a part per billion and better. So how does it do that? This is a space-time diagram. So this is time, and this is height. And the blue line gives me the position of a single atom. Usually, I have a laser pointer, so that's actually a useful demo for this. Just imagine that this is my atom. How do I get an atom inside a vacuum chamber that doesn't fall out the trap? Well, first, I pump the air out so that it doesn't collide with air molecules. Then I use laser cooling. That's a technology that was a Nobel Prize in 97. And one of the symptoms for the fast progress in atomic physics is that Here's something that was a Nobel Prize not even 30 years ago, and I won't even bother to explain it in detail. <laughs> but essentially, you use radiation pressure from laser beams to hold your atom in place. OK? Now we can turn off the lasers that hit the atom from the top and keep the ones from the bottom on, and that will push the atom upwards at a velocity of about 4 or 5 meters per second. They will go up one or two meters inside a vacuum chamber before turning around and falling down. Now I have two seconds during which the atom is in free fall, not subject to any forces. Atoms have very well controlled properties. I can put them in a quantum state where they do couple to magnetic fields if I want to. But usually I put them in a quantum state where they are not coupled to magnetic fields to leading order. So we can make sure to very high degree of precision that these atoms don't interact with any known force. 
at this time, we fire a laser at the atom. Now, sometimes nothing happens, but sometimes a photon hits the atom and kicks it further upwards. Okay. Now the laws of quantum mechanics kick in, and they say, well, an atom is a wave. And if I use that picture, then now my wave is in two states. One keeps on the old trajectory, the other moves a little higher. And one of the spooky features of quantum mechanics is that this wave, this particle, can be in two locations at the same time, so long as nobody is looking. Um, that's put to work here. At a f time, maybe half a second later, we fire the laser again, this time kicking the lower part of the atom up and the upper part down so that they meet in the end. Now, when two waves meet, then you know they can interfere, which means if they oscillate in phase, then they will combine to form a larger wave. And in quantum mechanics, that means a large probability of finding the particle. But if they oscillate out of phase, then they will combine to form a small amplitude, and that means a small amplitude of finding the particle. So I can calculate the phase difference of these two waves, and then I know whether most of my atoms will come out here or come out here. And we count those atoms by exciting them to an excited state, and then they will start fluorescing, and we're detecting that light on a camera. Okay? This data has been the most sensitive atomic interferometer for about 10 years. It's been taken by my colleague Ken Yao Chang at Stanford. And you see that as a function of this phase difference, I find the probability of detecting the atom going up and down just as expected. The phase difference, ignore the complicated equation, so this first part is relevant only if I'm in a rotating frame, let's assume I'm not. Then the phase difference is given by the wave number of the photons, that's how hard does my photon kick the atom, by the acceleration, which includes gravity, and this pulse separation time squared. The secret is that if I insert k, that's 10 to the 7 waves per meter for an infrared laser, a is 10 meters per second square, and t is roughly a second, then I get 100 million or so radians of phase difference between the two arms. But as you see, a one radian phase difference makes a huge difference in the number of atoms that I count. So this is a huge lever arm a part per billion change in the acceleration will give me a percent change in the likelihood of detecting the atom. That makes this atom interferometer a microscope for tiny effects. Our group has worked a lot on making this even better, and one way to make it even better is to kick the atoms with many photons, thus increasing the splitting between the two arms and the red, the black dots that are actually very small, so they look like this. This is how the sine wave data looks like when I kick the atoms with 18 photons, versus the blue line, which is simulated, is for standard technology. So you see how the sensitivity goes way up in that way. There are other technologies, for example, so we looked at this one, kick the atoms harder to gain more signal, we can run two atom interferometers at the same time to cancel signals that we don't want to measure, such as vibrations, and enhance signals that we do want to measure. So this example is dramatic. There is, this is the output of one of these interferometers, and this is the other. And if you don't see the sine wave in there, it's not just because the figure is so small, there is really no sine wave. That's because the vibrations mess everything up. But if I use this one as the x-coordinate and this one as the y-coordinate, it turns out they form an ellipse. And from fitting the shape of the ellipse, I can extract the signal even if I don't see the fringes here. 
And that has allowed us to enhance the sensitivity a thousandfold because we're no longer measuring the vibrations. Finally, if I fire my laser now, split the atoms along this line, and fire it half a second later, the laser beam has turned a bit because the Earth turns. And so the two pieces of the atoms miss each other by a small amount. But since they're so small, that matters. So we installed a rotating mirror, and when the rotation rate runs counter to the Earth's rotation, then you see how the interference contrast goes up. So the Earth turns, and we found out ourselves. And thank you very much for your attention. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, these technologies are now in use everywhere. So this is an example from the Markasevich group at Stanford. Um, this is the best ellipse that we've ever measured, best in terms of very good signal-to-noise ratio. This is my one bragging slide, so bear with me. It has a good contrast. Most importantly, it's the largest matter wave phase difference that has ever been measured. The group by Markasevich has a larger phase difference, but they cannot measure what it is. That's why this qualifier, measured, is important. Okay. Um, but if you say, I want to really know it and not just generate a very large one, then this is the largest and in that sense has the highest sensitivity. And it's the largest splitting of about a centimeter where you can still measure the phase difference. Again, larger ones have been created, but they're no longer measurable. Okay. Um, this is how the apparatus looks like. So this thing is about eight feet long. The atomic fountain is buried beneath this optics. It's about two meters high. And what you're seeing is lots of lasers like this one, and then lots of optical elements like this mirrors to steer the laser beams into the right place, to turn them on and off at the right time, to shift their frequencies, and so on. We can use that to test gravity, for example, Here's a test of the isotropy of gravity, where we've simply measured the Earth's gravity for a couple of days. And if Newton is correct, then gravity should not depend on the, it should depend on the distance between two objects, but not on which direction is this distance pointing. So if I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and measure the gravity from the Earth's core, it should be constant and not a function of the Earth's rotation. Well, sure enough, we found that it is a function, but that's an influence of the tides. The moon is gravitating, the sun is gravitating, and after subtracting that, you see it's pretty constant, and that puts limits on parameters that tell you how valid isotropy of gravity is. It's kind of a Michelson-Morley test for gravity. It's valid at the 10 to minus 9 part per billion level of precision, and that precision is similar to what's achieved with lunar laser ranging, where you measure the orbit of the moon very precisely. And this is not a coincidence because they are both, both measurements are limited by tidal models. Right? Um, you can test the equivalence principle and We've worked a lot on that, but since I want to get to the dark energy part, suffice it to say that using atom interferometers in addition to lots of other experiments testing the equivalence principle. Actually, what is the equivalence principle? It's the statement that two objects that are put at the same place and drop will drop at the exact same rate, no matter what their composition. Atom interferometers if I parameterize my deviations from the equivalence principle and add atom interferometers, we can improve the knowledge of these parameters by factors between 40 and over 1,000. Okay. And yeah. Okay, now I'm getting to the two points. Actually, this paper, I should give credit where it's due. It's been written by my postdoc, Mike Hohensee, in collaboration with a nuclear physicist at Argonne National Lab, Bob Wieringer. He's one of the grandmasters of nuclear theory, because all these models depend on nuclear composition. Now I'm getting to my two main topics about 
dark matter and dark energy. The first is a precision measurement of the fine structure constant. Fine structure constant tells me how strongly two bodies interact electromagnetically. If I know precisely how strong they do that, I can use that in theories to make predictions for other quantities. And if these predictions check out, then I know that nothing in this chain of theory and experiment has been subject to an unknown interaction. But because we can do that with 10 digits of precision, if some unknown force exists, it is not too unlikely to influence this chain somewhere. And this is our window for detecting dark matter candidates here. This has been started by my postdoc Xiao Yu Lan, who is now a professor in Singapore, and is now being run by my other postdoc Richard Parker, who is from Argonne National Lab, and my grad students Brian Este and Cheng Wei. So here is the experimental situation. The fine structure constant tells you the strength of the electromagnetic force. This is, of course, important everywhere. And so methods from all of physics can be used to measure it. But the two best methods are atom interferometry that I'll explain soon. It works to 0.7 part per billion of precision. And measuring the electron's gyromagnetic ratio. That number tells you the following. Each electron is a tiny little magnet because of its spin. And the so-called g factor of the electron tells you how strong is that magnet. Now simple, well not simple, according to Dirac quantum mechanics, that g factor is exactly 2. But field theory tells you that it's a tiny bit larger. And the deviation from 2 is a function of the fine structure constant. And this deviation from 2 has been measured to 0.25 parts per billion of precision. Now you calculate backwards and measure the fine structure constant. The flavor of this measurement is here. If I, the atom interferometer is sensitive to a quantity called h over m. Why? The Planck constant h tells me how strongly my atoms get kicked by the photons. The photon momentum is the wave number times the Planck constant. And the heavier the atoms, the less they worry about this kick. If I kick a heavy atom with the same impulse, it will move less. So the overall effect seen in the atom interferometer depends on this ratio. If I take that ratio and I know the Rydberg constant, which essentially tells me the hydrogen energy levels, and I know the ratio of the mass of an electron to the mass of my atom, I can plug them into this equation and calculate the fine structure constant. So far, so good. But the great news is that all these measurements can be done at 10 digits of precision. Consider that. That's something like measuring the length of a year to a microsecond or something like that, right? F knowing the fine structure constant, I can use the standard model of particle physics and lots of features of the standard model enter to predict g minus 2, how strong is the magnet of an electron. And this can also be measured to 10 digits of precision. And incredibly enough, the standard model is precise enough, again, at 10 digits. So we have the unique situation in physics that there are measurements connected by intricate yet precise theory that predict another quantity which can be measured to the same precision. Now here are all the particles, obviously the electrons, but also the muon, hadrons, maybe even the weak interaction that shift this value g around. If there was a new kind of particle, such as a dark photon, which is one of those ultralight dark matter candidates, it might shift this value and we want to find it. So we set out to do this, built an atom interferometer that looks like this. Um, so mostly send an atom along two paths. We run one upward version and a downward version to cancel vibrations, as before. And we introduce a so-called matter wave accelerator here, based on a physics phenomenon known as Bloch oscillations, to 
increase the signal even further. So this is relatively standard except for this phase where we increase the splitting between the two interferometers even further. And that should give us this quantity h over m. Here are 10 hours of data that are good enough to determine the fine structure constant to a quarter part per billion precision. That's the promised 10 digits of precision. But this is, of course, worthless if we don't understand our sources of error very well. And here's one example. We vary the pulse separation time. And if everything checks out, then the data should, look, should lie on this blue line. But you see, they don't really do it that well. We trace the source of this discrepancy to atoms not being at the center of our laser beams. And so we overlapped a second thin laser beam to pre-select the atoms that are at the center of the big beam and then only use these atoms. And then it looks like this. So you can't see the discrepancy anymore, even though the error bars have shrunk a lot. Here's a plot of only the discrepancy measured at different times. And you see they are all very close to 0. If you should worry about this point, that's OK, because these are so-called one sigma error bars, which means in a series of nine measurements, you expect one or two outliers statistically. So we're not worried about this. And this data determines the fine structure constant to a quarter to 0.3 parts per billion, even after correcting for systematics. There's a long list of checks that we've run. I mean, there's one we still need to do. There's a big error budget, and it turns out that 0.2 part per billion or 0.3 is roughly what will be. Now, will this get boring? Can we just go on and on and on and discover nothing? Well, this is the g factor of the muon. The electron has a heavy sibling. It's called the muon for which the g factor deviates from theories. These are all the measurements. This is the theory, and you see it doesn't agree. There's a muon g minus 2 collaboration at Fermilab that tries to make a better measurement to find if this is real or not. If this is real, it could be a signal for dark photons. If it's not real, well, then we're back to the drawing board. The funny thing is, if this discrepancy is real, then there should be an analogous discrepancy for the electron at 0.07 parts per billion. So we should see that if we get another three times better. Okay, And this is another example for doing high energy physics with low energy experiments. And it has a chance to look for one of those dark matter candidates. Okay, Let me check the time. OK, I have about 10 more minutes. In these 10 minutes, I want to talk about dark energy. So bottom line here is fine structure constant measurements are sensitive to new physics because you can compare them with measurements of the electron's gyromagnetic ratio and have a chance of actually digging into this parameter space where we know if this anomaly is confirmed, of course, then it's a huge discovery. But even if we can say, no, this anomaly is not found for the electron, it is a significant result because an anomaly is expected from that data. If it doesn't exist, that would be contrary to observation, uh, to expectation. All right, now dark energy. We didn't know that we could do anything about dark energy until until about 15 months ago, when my postdoc Paul Hamilton found a paper on the preprint server written by two English theorists and one experimentalist that told us, yes, an atom interferometer is a sensor that can detect or rule out one model of dark energy. Paul is by now deservedly assistant professor at UCLA. Philip Haslinger has taken over for him. And Matt Jaffe is just the dream of a grad student. We're also collaborating with Justin Curry, who is at University of Pennsylvania, who has invented this theory of dark energy. That's important because 
I'm not a dark energy specialist, so it's good to have one on board. So let's take a look at how that works. Most theorists these days assume that dark energy is a so-called cosmological constant, an extra term in general relativity that acts somewhat like a pressure that drives stuff apart and would have no other consequences that than causing the universe to expand. If that explanation is true, then B experimentalists have nothing to do. <laughs> the cosmological constant also makes a very specific prediction for the ratio of that pressure to the density of dark energy, and that's a measurable quantity. It should be minus one. If it is not minus one, then a cosmological constant is not viable. And that's why people have started thinking, OK, those measurements get better and better. Maybe one day they'll de deviate significantly from minus one. Then we need to have a better model. And such models are called quintessence. That word has been coined by Paul Steinhardt at Princeton. It essentially means any new particle that I might invent to explain composition of dark energy. A dark energy particle would have to be exceedingly light because otherwise it would clump to form galaxies. It would just get gravitationally attracted to the galaxies and clump. But we know that dark energy is distributed evenly, so it has to be very light. But inventing light particles causes trouble usually because it would be expected to cause forces between normal objects, such as, well, maybe these two, right? Just like photons cause electromagnetic forces between objects, any new invented light particle would cause forces. And that's contrary to very precise experiment. But Justin Corey thought, well, maybe there's a way to hide these forces. And it is shown here. This plot shows the energy density of dark energy as a function of the density of my new invented field. Usually, this would be a parabola that slopes up. The more electromagnetic field I have, the more energy I have. For dark energy, it has to be the opposite. It has to go down, because then we get something called inflation, which is needed in cosmological models. For, so. This field wants to be at low density, right? Which would cause inflation, which we think happened in the cosmos. So that's why it's expected to go down. Now let's assume I couple it to normal matter in this way. So this coupling goes up if I have more dark energy. And so the net effect, the net energy density, is this red line, which has a minimum here. In empty space, that minimum is very shallow and at a very high value of phi, my field density. But in this room, where there's always normal matter in the form of air, that minimum would be at a low value and be strongly curved. Now, the idea is the curvature of this, and I'm not a field theorist, but, so I won't explain all the details, um, but the curvature of this energy density is the mass of the particle. Usually, and so in this room, this curvature is high, so the mass of the particle is high. In empty space, the mass is low. So this is good, because dark energy needs to have low mass. But in the lab, it has high mass. And now the inside, and so far, this is just based on generic once um, on generic properties of dark energy that we think are more likely true than not. So this is not a new invention or anything. The insight is that a particle with high mass mediates a short-ranged force. Photons are massless, and so the electromagnetic field has an infinite range. But W bosons are very massive, and that's why the weak force, the standard weak force, is very short range. It's actually a misnomer. The weak force isn't weaker than electromagnetism, but it's much more short range 
that's why we think it's weak. And so this chameleon would be extremely short-ranged in an experiment and thus hard to rule out. Here's how it works. The gravity between these two objects is weak and therefore very hard to detect, right? But at least it couples to all the mass in the microphone and all the mass in the cell phone. The chameleon field would get short-ranged as soon as it enters the sphere, and therefore it couples only to a thin outermost skin of the sphere, only the outermost nanometer. So try to detect the gravity between these two objects if it would act only on the outermost nanometer of these two objects. That would be an impossible task, and that's why the chameleon field is so hard to detect and has been able to evade detection so far. And yet, it's um, compatible with the cosmological observations. So this is at Copeland and Claire Bourrage and at Heinz. And they have had a better idea of how to possibly detect this thing. So I should confess that when I first read about this chameleon theory, I thought it's a total conspiracy theory, right? It's just designed such that we poor experimentalists can't test it, and so the theorists can do whatever they like and not run into trouble, right? And we experimentalists don't like that, and that's why I like these people a lot. They told us how to do it anyway. So they just said, okay, if I use two massive spheres, then I have this problem that it couples only to the outermost nanometer, but if I replace one of these spheres by an atom, well, the outermost nanometer of an atom is the entire atom, and so I'm rid of one of these suppression factors. And so we need to measure a new force on a single atom. This is our atom interferometer that we use to do it. It's a little special because we need to gain high sensitivity in a tightly confined space. The atoms need to be close to that aluminum sphere all the time and can't fall away. So we have to have a method that doesn't require a meter or so of free fall distance. And it involved enclosing everything in a resonant optical cavity where I have resonantly enhanced laser beams. And if you want to know the details, it has appeared in a first ref letter paper earlier this year. But here's the basic principle. Here's an aluminum sphere in a vacuum chamber. And here are our atoms actually split now in a lower and a higher state on these trajectories. And we're looking for a force between the atoms and the sphere. Obviously, most of that force is from Earth's gravity. So we have to eliminate that by moving the sphere in and out and looking for any changes. And then this is a photograph of the setup. Here's our vacuum chamber. It's about this large. This is the movable aluminum sphere. And on top of the sphere, in this false color image, you can see the cloud of atoms. And there's a little hole in the sphere that you can see here to pass the laser beam. OK, then here are interference fringes again, right? Now, we measure this with the sphere nearby. That's the red dots. And far away, that's the blue dots. We repeat all these measurements with the laser beams inverted to take out some sources of errors. And then here is the crucial data. This is a histogram showing the measured acceleration. Zero is here. And so you see this data spreads evenly around zero with no indication of a chameleon-induced force. Here is the number in the end. And so what does that number mean? Well. One way to characterize the chameleon theory is by one number that tells you the steepness of this potential. You remember that graph with the down sloping potential. The n just tells you how strongly it slopes down. And then this number is how strongly does the chameleon couple to normal matter. And the funny thing is, if this number is very low, 
then the chameleon is already ruled out because then the chameleon isn't screened, would look like Newtonian gravity, and we know there's nothing special about Newtonian gravity. So very low numbers are ruled out. What about the other end of the scale? Well, there is a white space where we used to have no limits, and then eventually you run into trouble with neutron interferometry. Neutron interferometry, actually I'm humbled to have one of the world's experts on neutron interferometers in the audience, Danny Greenberger, who's with us. They, essentially the principle of these experiments is the same as with the atom interferometer. Our competitive advantage is that atoms are way cheaper than neutrons because neutrons need to be made in a nuclear reactor. So we have more atoms and therefore a better signal to noise. And so this would be the limit from our experiment. And depending on where you look, it's about a thousand times more sensitive. There's still white space, so we haven't completely ruled out everything. You can also compare it to large scale collaborations. There's a so-called CERN Axion Solar Telescope, which uses astrophysics to rule out chameleons. And there's a gum EV collaboration, which looks for so-called chameleon afterglow effect. I've, I'll spare you the details of that experiment, but suffice it to say that these two experiments can see the chameleon or rule out the chameleon, provided that it couples to photons. Okay, so this scale means that here the chameleon can decay into photons and back, and then these experiments rule it out. But neutron interferometers don't need that coupling, so they provide more generally applicable limits. And these limits have again been improved by our experiment roughly thousandfold. All right, so anything worth doing is worth doing twice. First, quick and dirty, and then as good as you can. So now we're going for as good as we can. We have more atoms now, we have a vibration isolation, we are able now to launch the atoms rather than just drop them, and as a result of all of that, we can now measure about a hundred times more sensitive. So you remember before it was micro G, now it's nano G in about the same time. So we're already hundred times better, and here's some outlook. Um, but let's digest this for just half a minute. Before I said we have been a thousand times better than previous experiments in ruling out this one model, but there was a lot of white space. If we fill this white space, then these types of dark energy candidates are gone. And this is already starting to become a good limit. Um, that will fill the additional white space a little bit. I want to give you just the best of other atom interferometry things. One is, if I can measure h over m, the ratio of the Planck constant to the mass, and you tell me the Planck constant, then I can tell you the mass, right? And this is this paper here we published a while ago where you can actually apply that. So people now want to get rid of the standard kilogram that's stored in Paris. It's the last unit defined by an artifact. And one way to do that is to assign a fixed value to the Planck constant. And then you can build a machine called a Watt balance to measure mass in that context. Or you can use an atom interferometer to measure the mass of one atom and then make spheres of so precise proportions that you can count atoms effectively. So that's a totally different application using atom interferometers to measure mass. Putting it in space is on the agenda of NASA, and the reason is simple. The chameleon measurement on the ground is limited to 10 milliseconds time or so, because that's as long as it takes the atom to fall too far away from the sphere. In space, they could just hover close to the sphere for as long as I want, maybe five seconds, and the sensitivity goes up quadratically with this time. And then you can also measure the fine structure constant there and so on. 
They are going to launch the so-called Cold Atom Lab in 2017, they say, but these dates are always somewhat flexible, right? And that could be the predecessor of a serious atom interferometer mission. Atom interferometry is also a good thing to study antimatter because you never need to touch the atom. You manipulate it with lasers only. And finally, here's my summary. So here's our limits on chameleon dark energy. Here's the white space we want to fill. And here's the data for the fine structure constant. And if we can make this even three times better, that's a way to rule out some models of dark matter, or maybe perhaps detect them. But what I really want to, what really makes me excited about this field is that there is just so many other well-motivated candidates for dark matter and dark energy that can perhaps show up in atomic physics experiments. So if you ask me, do you believe in the chameleon model? I, I, tell you, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's one model. It agrees with the data so far. Fine. But since we're essentially really looking for the key in the dark, it's important to look under many street lights. And there are many street lights that can be turned on in atomic physics. With that, I would like to thank our collaborator, Justin Curry at the University of Pennsylvania. He looks better than us. And that would be Paul Hamilton, who started dark energy research in my lab, Matt Jaffe, myself, and Philip Hasling. And many thanks also to the funding agencies. And most importantly, to you for listening. Thank you so much.